Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Um, today theorem is kind of an existent theorem, so a certain type of object, well, let me spoil the story, a certain type of object called an expander graph or expander graphs, um, they do exist. And those expander graphs, they became very popular recently. So recently in the sense of mathematics, because they are related to many real world problems. And I'm going to uh, sketch that at the very end. I will just start off with the kind of the abstract definition, um, which already looks like it should be important, but then as, as soon as you see the application, it's kind of completely obvious that you want to construct a lot of these graphs. Uh, turns out that the construction of these graphs is not trivial at all. Um, so they're kind of trying to find the balance between two contradicting properties in some sense. So you have one property that you want to maximize and you want to minimize it at the same time. And uh, we'll see. So kind of they try to find a balance, as I said, between two contradicting properties and Whenever you have that, it's not clear whether such an object actually should exist. Uh, they do exist. Otherwise, there would be a video, obviously. Um, but uh, we'll see what that actually means. So kind of there, the two contradicting properties is that they are kind of very sparse and at the same time, very connected. It doesn't quite fit together. They don't have many edges if you want, but they somehow have a lot of edges in some other sense. We'll see what that means. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to cut a cake into two pieces um, or maybe a graph into two pieces. And I would like to do it in a somehow as fair as possible way if you want. So here's my cake, uh, a very boring cake, whatever, uh, just part of a cake or whatever, it doesn't matter. And I cut it into two. Um, and I kind of want to do that in the sense that I want to kind of have graphs that are hard to cut. Some of them graphs like that should be called uh, expanders. So I would like them to be very difficult to cut in two sets as and as prime. Um, and I kind of want them to have very few edges at the same time. So hard to cut would mean here, I will go into details in a second. Hard to cut is something like in, in this cut here, there are a lot of edges, right? So, um, so in this little cut, let me make it red. In this little red cut, there are a lot of edges so that's kind of hard to cut. But at the same time, I would like to have them very few edges. So obviously, if you have a graph, you'll see that in examples that has lots of edges, then it's then it's kind of hard to cut. And if a graph has very few edges, then it should be easy to cut. Um, and kind of the expanders are the graphs that sit in the middle. And what I'm going to address is the problem, whether they actually exist or not. Okay, before I kind of go to the form, more formal definition, uh, let me repeat. So we kind of want a graph that is hard to cut, like, like, like this cake here, into two bits. Uh, hard to cut means there are a lot of edges you always need to cut, but at the same time, um, have very few edges, right? So hard to cut, but has few edges. And that's an expander. Okay, so let's, let's give it some details. So here I have uh, a real graph, not a cake, um, which is maybe more mass than whatever, food science, what is cake? I have no idea what a cake is. A cake is a cake and a graph is a graph, very good. Anyway, so I have divide my graph into two subsets. So here, uh, the other one is G without S and I have little s. And the measurement of how hard this is to cut is what's called a boundary. And the boundary are just all the connecting edges between S and GS. And the numbers of the boundary is just the number of the boundary. So the connecting edges here are this, this, uh, this, this, four, this, this, this one, this one. So eight in total. I have eight connecting edges. So cutting S from G, uh, from SG, like in this picture here. Um, so this would be G without S, is kind of difficult of order eight, if you want. Um, and okay, that's almost the notion we want. It's not quite the one because then it's kind of kind of a little bit biased towards cutting very small pieces from a very large graph, right? So if you just have one edge, you can just somewhat easily cut it off. Uh, so if S is very small and my G was at G without S is really large. 
in order to kind of make it more the cake type cutting picture, the fair cut picture, I kind of bias um, the, the large sets are nicer. And how we do do is that we divide this number here by the size of the set. So in this case, it would be eight divided by four, right? So we just divide that and take the minimum of all the subsets, right? So take the minimum of all the subsets. And we only need to do half of them because the other half is somehow encoded as well. Uh, so kind of, you can you can kind of ignore this part here. Let's ignore it. Uh, so you take the minimum over all subsets, uh, over all possible subsets and the way how they are connected, weighted by kind of making the fair cuts uh, nicer. So I just divide by the order of S. And this thing is called the H, um, H expansion constant, sometimes called Chigas constant. Uh, I will probably just give them both names to confuse everyone. I will just use both names. Uh, very good. That's didactically absolutely fantastic. So I will go, I will do it. Uh, anyway, so the slogan, I will denote this thing by H of G. And it's somehow it's a measurement, right? So um, H, a large H means it's hard to cut. We'll see that in example in a second. And a small H means there's a bottleneck, so like something like this, right? So if, if, if you have a really large subset and you can cut it off from S prime, which is this one here, uh, with a very few cuts, this number gets very small and then you kind of have a bottleneck in your graph. Right? So, um, so we kind of want this number to be very large. We kind of want to avoid bottlenecks in graphs. And at the same time, kind of we want to have a large age, right? few bottlenecks, but also few edges. And that's not clear, as, as I said, that it should work. But let's have a look at the example how age actually works. OK, so here I have a family of complete graphs, in this case, just a K3. And I just put two of them next to one another. And then I kind of define a family of graphs, GI, for i from a zero to n by just connecting a certain edges in between those two graphs. Right? They could have one edge, I could have two edges, or three edges, or zero edges. And uh, what I want to do is I want to cut s from g without s, and kind of the number of edges that I need to cut is encoded by i. Right? So that's how I want to do it. And because I kind of take complete graphs on each side, this will really compute a Chigas constant. Okay, so I get this family of graphs, G0, G1, G2, Gn. I will draw uh, all of them momentarily for n equals 3. So G0 is just, uh, let me draw it like this. So two copies of this little triangle. G1 is just two copies of this little triangle with an edge. G2 is two copies of this little triangle with two edges. And G3 is, of course, the one you see uh, right here on this slide. And the number of things I need to cut is always uh, 0, 1, 2, right? So 0, 1, 2, and here it's 3. Um, and the size of the subset I cut away is always n because it's kn, right? So, so that's why the chica constant of those graphs goes from 0, 1 over n, 2 over n, all the way up to n over n, which is 1. So one is large in this, in the setting, I should say that. So one is large and everything close to zero is small. So one over n is really, really tiny. And of course, my little graph here, uh, so the G1 graph, which is this one, has an obvious bottleneck here, just this connecting edge. So tiny h is really saying bottleneck. Large h, large meaning is something around one or something. Uh, large h means there are essentially no bottlenecks. Right? Bottlenecks. The H measures H is a measurement for bottlenecks. And um, the theorem is families of expanders exist. And I should tell you what an expander is. So here's the definition. We have a, well, actually, I want a sequence of them. So I have a sequence of graphs, which I just call gamma here, and they're indexed by the natural numbers. And we should think of gamma n as having n vertices. Let's just do that. Okay. Well, that's kind of is the first condition. Not quite, but it's good enough. So a gamma n has n vertices. And um, so the second condition says that the graphs are not very dense. Right? So the, the degree of if each vertex is at most a given a given number. Well, the graphs won't be too dense. And this 
to, to just kind of not too dense. And the third condition is exactly there are no bottlenecks because the Chiga constant is kind of uniformly for all n, right? for all n, let me stress that, the Chiga constant is uniformly bounded away from zero. So they're simultaneously sparse because of condition two, they don't have too many edges and highly connected because they don't have any bottlenecks because the Chiga constant is uh, uniformly away from, uh, from zero. And that these that the families of those graphs is absolutely not clear. And that's a beautiful theorem, which you could, for example, prove by constructing a family of examples. So let me just construct a family of examples for you. And I leave it to you to check that it's actually really a family of examples. So the vertex is that I fix a prime and I let my primes go to infinity. So in this case, I was lying a little bit. So n uh, gamma n won't have. Uh, n vertices, but the nth prime number of vertices, but that doesn't really matter. Anyway, so the number of vertices are just uh, given by the primes, and I just number my vertices one, sorry, zero up to p minus one. Okay, and I connect them as follows I put them on a circle. Very good. So here's zero somewhere, here's one somewhere, two, whatever, all the way up to whatever p minus one, uh, let's say all the way up to 30, hoping that 31 is actually a prime. Let's hope the best. If not, that doesn't really matter anyway. Uh, so they're connected to their neighbors and then you connect everyone to the inverse mod the prime. So two is connected to whatever inverse there is. Uh, three will be connected to whatever inverse of three, right? So, and one will, and so on. So um, whatever A will be the number such that A times two is congruent to one mod p. In other words, upon division by p, um, a times times uh, two times a leaves remainder one. So in my little example here, um, a would be sixteen. I hope that's true because uh, two times sixteen is thirty-two. So upon division by my little prime here is thirty-one. Upon division by thirty-one, this is remainder one. And you just do that along with the graph and you get a graph that is kind of a bit random. So it, it goes along in the circle. It looks a bit random because the edges really jump a little bit randomly. So kind of fun fact, if you connect A to A inverse mod P, um, that's exactly what we do, then the graph you get is, is pretty random. And sometimes something, something like connecting um, Mm, integers to the inverses mod p is used in several, in some format, of course, in several random generators. So essentially, this says that the, the edges of the graph are fairly random, and that's why it's so hard to separate. Because, of course, here yeah, every every edge has just three neighbors, namely the ones along the circle and its inverse. Um, yeah, forget the inverse for zero, by the way, zero doesn't matter here. Um, anyway, so you just have uh, this one, and you can kind of disconnected very, uh, in a very hard way. So there are no bottlenecks because the edges kind of jump completely randomly through the graph. I leave it to you to really figure out why this fits into this definition. It's not so terribly hard to see, though, if you know a little bit about the properties of uh, inversion mod P. Okay, and why did they became very, very popular? So expander graphs became very popular very quickly because they are really, really applicable. Why would, would that be the case? Well, we have kind of no bottlenecks in our graphs. And at the same time, they are highly efficient, but right? they don't have many edges. And that's something a lot of real world problems would like to do as well. So a lot of graphs that you actually construct in the real world um, should be expanders. Think about computer networks. You don't want bottlenecks of computer networks, but at the same time, you don't want to have too many crazy connections because it's way too expensive. I think about your brain. So my brain is mostly garbage anyway, so my brain doesn't count. But your brain, it should be an expander graph. So you don't want any bottlenecks. Oh, it's kind of very bad for a brain, I guess. But you also don't want too many connections. That's kind of, again, highly inefficient. Um, think of railway or tram works or something like that, right? And we really don't want any bottlenecks. So they should, should have a really high uh, Chica constant. And at the same time, they should be efficient. 
So expanders will say today, that's exactly what expanders do. So you want large families of those because in the end, kind of all these real world uh, networks, real world graphs should fit into this, uh, want these properties, right? So no bottlenecks is certainly preferable for uh, a railway network, right? There's a bottleneck um, and whatever a train crashes and then everything is stopped, that's really bad. At the same time, you want it to be cost efficient. Okay, so I hope there was a lot of motivation or at least good motivation to motivate why expander graphs uh, should be useful somehow and uh, why they kind of spiked. So with, in, in the whatever last 30 years, computer networks in particular became very, very famous and popular and important. Uh, so, and they're kind of the, the kind of the real test case here for expanders because that's where you want an expander graph. So constructions of good expander graphs is always, always a really good project. Um, and well, the brain kind of does it uh, by nature if you want, <laughs> but maybe for a computer network or for a tram, you really want to have a design um, that kind of spits out as many expanders as possible. Kind of having this balance between no bottlenecks and being cost efficient. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.